couple of weeks ago, we started a series on healthy homes. And I started by saying pretty much every person that you talk to, when you ask how healthy is your home, we're generally overwhelmed by all the things that aren't healthy rather than the bits that are healthy in our homes. And we talked about the importance of families in the Bible. Um, Psalm 68 says, God places the lonely in families. And truly, some of the most lonely people I've ever met are in families. Families that are always around, but people are lonely. And we talked about the importance of us as church as not just being called the family of God, but actually being the family of God. And actually recognizing that we are actually blood family by the blood of Jesus. He has reconciled us to one another and that we have our biological families, we have our extended families, and we have the family of God here. We also talked about households and how God brings people into our lives for seasons, or God brings, pardon me, God brings um, family, friends, um, just people that are on the same journey as you, people that are in your sphere of influence, people that you are roommates with, people that you might live with in a retirement home, people that you just, they're part of your inner sanctum and you do life with them. They are part of your household. In the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say, Old Testament and New Testament, about the impact of the love of God, not just upon an individual, not just upon their family, but upon their household. And God has placed you, maybe not in the perfect family and maybe not in the perfect household, but he has planted you in a household and you are there to make a difference and to bring the love of Jesus into that household. And uh, so that's, that's kind of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And today, I want to talk about how we be present in our families. I think it's really hard. It's something I really struggle with. Let me just tell you a parable, one that I just made up. Imagine a young mother walking to the park. Not a care in the world, and she's walking down to the park. She opens the gate, and she goes to the playground, and she's got her little toddler daughter with her. Oh, how cute. Isn't that awesome? And she takes her little toddler daughter into the playground, and she says, Mummy, Mummy, can you swing me, please? And then the mum swings her like three times, and then the kid gets bored and wants to go into something else. And then the kid proceeds to play on the playground, and then the mum has a well-earned rest on the bench and then whips out her phone and then proceeds to um, check her social media, check her emails, or we don't know because I can't read the mum's mind. I don't know what she's doing. And then the other mums come to the playground and the other dads come to the playground and they're kind of engaging with their kids and, and this mum is sitting on the bench and then 20 minutes later, every now and again she pokes her head up to see is everything all right? But generally, this is a key to parenting. If your kids are upset, they'll normally scream, okay? So it's pretty safe that you can stay engaged with the phone. It's all good. And, <clears throat> and then other people come and go and then after 20 minutes, half an hour, depending on how uh, much your kid likes playing at the playground, um, the mum looks up and says, all right, we're going now. And then after some protest from the child, the mum and the daughter leave the playground. And I wonder if you're one of the people in this world that would judge that mother. The reason why I didn't say a father is because generally people are a lot more sympathetic and forgiving of fathers. It's like, oh, well, at least he's taking the kid out. <laughs> but people are a lot more judgmental towards mothers. Can I hear an Amen. And it's not just men that are judgmental. Do you know what I mean? Other mums? Yeah. Do I need to go there? <laughs> Let me paint another picture. You're a restaurant, cafe. And actually, I was talking to someone. Um, actually, Billy, are you here? <laughs> Billy, you remember that conversation? You're at a cafe because we've both got young kids. And you're at the cafe and you're, you're eating. And if you ever whip out the iPad or the iPhone to kind of pacify your kids. Some of the world's best babysitters right here. And I don't know about you, but have you ever been one of those people that judges those parents that, oh, back in the old days, we used to know about real parenting. All of that kid needs is some discipline. Um, and, and, and it's like, they, you know, they, they prefer their kids being on a screen than really communicating with their kid. And has, actually, I won't ask you if you've ever judged because I know some of you have and I don't want to embarrass you. But 
It's a tension in our world. There's a tension for parents. There's a tension for people that are married. There's a tension for all of us to survive. To survive the cafe and the restaurant. Do you know the truth? Billy and I were talking about this and the truth is what we want to tell everyone in the cafe and everyone in the restaurant is the reason why my kid is on the iPad is for your sake. Because there would be a lot of noise otherwise. With my kids, I mean, sometimes it's like, do you want my kids, you know, pulling your tablecloth off and eating your food or do you want them to be on the iPad, okay? (laughs) And there's a tension that it's not a problem to be solved, it's a tension to be managed. This tension in our world between surviving, getting through the day, getting through a situation, getting through life, but then also not just being so numb that we just get through, but we actually engage emotionally. Do you know what I mean? Because if you're always emotionally engaging, you will blow up or you will burn out or you will fall in a heap because it's just too much. There are times when you need to just get through. That mum at the playground, what if she's had what if she's got four kids at home? And there's been screaming and there's been yelling. And what if she's going through a health crisis? Or what if there's issues at work? She's working part-time to try to support the family and she's stressed and she gets to the playground and for the first time all day, her little toddler girl is happy, God forbid. And she's happy on the playground. And so what does the mum do? She thinks, oh, thank God, I'm going to spend 20 minutes to myself while my daughter is happy on the playground. Because when your kids are happy, that is good. When your wife is happy, when your husband is happy, when you parents are happy life is good but what can happen is there's a tension towards not just being on all the time not just towards coping but saying hey I want to be present in the moment and I think some of us we are so intent upon being perfect children perfect parents perfect spouses that we can be striving and we can be trying but we can and we can be present physically but we can't but we can be absent emotionally Is this just me that struggles with this? Or do you sometimes struggle? I want to show you a really cool passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And it's just got some really key insights for all of us in our family life. And this applies to whatever household you're part of. First point I want to make is this. Loving families begin and end with humility over over... That should be power. Humility over power. I think whether you're a kid, let me tell you this. If you're a kid and you think you know better than your parents, you don't. If you're a parent and you think you've got all the insight and your kids know nothing, you don't. If you're the big man of the house and you're like, I'm the head of this home and everyone should do... No, you're not. Jesus is the head of your home. If you're the matriarch of your family and you think you're kind of the glue that holds everything together, no, you're not. You see, the key for all of our relationships, whether it's married, whether it's parent, child, whether it's friends, is humility and service over power. Let's read this. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 6 and 7. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. Instead, we were like young children among you. The great Apostle Paul, one of the most influential men in history, came to serve this young church in northern Greece. And he said, when I came to you, I could have used authority. I could have used the fact that God is using me in a profound way. But when I came to you, I came to you as, a, as little kids, like a little kid. And other translators have had tra- challenges with this. And they've translated as I came to you in gentleness. But the most ancient manuscripts use this term, little kids. Isn't this amazing? Imagine if in all of our relationships, at work, at home, we said, I am going to have the posture of a little kid. What is a little kid? A little kid is vulnerable in what they don't know. They're vulnerable. They realise that they are not in control of everything. And a little kid does not come with power, but a little kid comes under the authority of another. Ultimately, when we're in relationships, we are always under the authority of God. And we always exist in vulnerability to serve the other before we go to exercise power over them. Number two, loving families are far more concerned about who we care for than who we're related to. It goes on to say, so instead you were like young, we were like young children among you. 
Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Paul doesn't mind shifting analogies here. He just throws his metaphors around like nothing. He's like, we were like little kids, now we were like mums. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Have you ever seen a nursing mother caring for her child and you just, you're like, can I have a nurse? And then you have a nurse and then you see them starting getting twitchy. It's like, give me back my child. You know, they, they, they want to nurse and nurture that child. Let me tell you this, that loving families care are more about who we care for than who we're related to. Do you know what? You might not be in the perfect family, but you might be in a position in life where there are people around you that you can care for. I think one of part of maturity is when you're growing up and when you stop seeing your parents as existing purely to care for you and meet your needs. It's a weird thing when you grow up and you realise, oh, what, my parents, they're not just my parents, they're human beings. And I don't just exist. Do you know what? The thing about caring for people is you might have a sister or a brother that don't deserve you to look after them, but because you're family, you get to care for them anyway. You might have children that might be rat bags, but your responsibility as people of God and as family is to care for them. You might have parents that didn't always love you in the way you deserve, but do you know what? God has put you in their life to care for them. And there's people outside of your biological family that they don't have anyone to care for them, but you get to be their family because you care for them. And I know some people that have cared for people in their final years of life and they have been like a spiritual son or a spiritual daughter to someone and it's like, you are my family. You see, I think we need to spend less time thinking about who's in my family, who's out of my family and start saying, who are the people that God has placed in my sphere of influence that I can care for? Because I believe that there's, in it, for each of us, there's people that we can care for. Number three, godly families care about being present, not just sacrificial. This is a big one. Paul goes on to say, Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order to not be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. You see, Paul was a missionary and he went to bring the gospel. But he said, do you know what? I didn't just bring the message of Jesus. I came to share my life with you. And my observation in in just looking around our church, looking around our society and looking at my own life is we can be very good at telling people what we do for them and sacrificing for people. You don't know how hard I work for this family. I work night and day. Don't get me started on all the sacrifices I've made for this family. Everything I did, I did for you. And we love to talk about our sacrifice. We love to talk about everything we've sacrificed for other people. But what does Paul say? He said, I didn't just sacrifice. I didn't just work night and day, which he did. He said, I came to share my life with you. And that is where I fall down. I wonder if you sometimes fall down in that area as well. I worked for you. I suffered for you. I struggled for you. I sacrificed for you in my family. I did this for you. And then they say, yeah, but you weren't really in my life. You were doing stuff for me. And I think sometimes I talk to some parents and when they tell me everything they do for their kids, like after school curriculum, I'm just like, man, I'm tired. And I've just been listening to you for the last two minutes. It's like there's music lessons and there's all these things. And and you just think, wow. I was talking to someone this morning and uh, in, after the early service and they were telling me about this, uh, he, actually Gary McLaughlin, he sells uh, a lot of uh, toys and stuff for kids' parties. And he said some families, they go so overboard. What they do for their kids, it's like in some cultures the equivalent for their birthday of what, we, what some people would do for a wedding. It's full on. And we were just talking about how often parents do things like that, and it's not just about doing it for the kids. It's so the parents feel like they're the best parents, that they feel like they're sacrificing, they feel like they're doing the best. And I think sometimes we want to feel like we're the best husband or wife. We want to feel like we're the best kid. We want to feel like we're the best parent. But we're sometimes we're just not being emotionally present. We're giving the best gifts. We're doing the most things, but we're just not being available. Um, just in ABC News just two days ago, there was an article about 
Our, parents, our fathers more and more are going through incredible distress and anxiety over the work family balance. But younger fathers that are coming through now, they're having less anxiety about work and more about family. I think there's been a real shift in our society towards previous generations where it was seen as the man works and the mother looks after the children. There's been a real shift and a discontent amongst younger fathers saying, I want to be emotionally and physically present in the lives of my children and I'm struggling to balance it. And um, in this sur survey, one in three kids wishes their dads weren't at work as much. I, th I was surprised it was as low as that. But I think it's really hard to be present emotionally because let me tell you some days if I've had a bad meeting here during the day or I'm just tired or I've, I'm overwhelmed by everything that I need to do and then I come home and my beautiful wife has got dinner ready on the table and it's ready to go and then she's out doing something and then I put my kids to bed and a task that should take 20 minutes takes a lot longer than 20 minutes and then by the time I come down, I just want some time to myself. I just want to, like, how good is television? Just to disengage. Or just social media or anything like that. And it's so hard to be present. And I think there's a reason why some of us aren't present. It's because we sometimes are just trying to survive. So it's not about pointing the finger. It's just about saying that, we need to get better at being present and not just being sacrificial for those that we love. I think the, f the final point I want to make is this, is that godly relationships care about encouraging, comforting and urging. This is the end of the passage and it's really, really cool. For you know how we dealt with each other as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Paul said, I came to you as a child. I was like a mother. And now he's saying I'm like a father. And the three words he uses in his relationships with these people, isn't it interesting that Paul was a single man, but the way he writes, he writes like a close family member. He writes like he loves them deeply. And he says, I came to you encouraging, comforting and urging. And I think that's what... Um, your relationships with your friends, your relationships with uh, your kids or parents, God wants you to encourage them. Not just to be in their vicinity, but to actually say, I want to encourage my parents. I want to encourage my kids. I want to encourage my siblings. Um, to comfort. That you can be around people. Have you ever been so consumed by your own need for comfort that you neglected the people around you that needed comfort more than you? that you were so caught up in what you were going through that there was someone in your family and you said, man, I didn't realise that you were going through that. I'm really sorry I wasn't there for you. And that can be really hard. In all of our relationships, we're to encourage, comfort and to urge and just to kind of help each other, to help each other make some steps towards God. Eugene Peterson in The Message says it this way, with each of you, we were like a father with his children. Listen to this holding your hand, whispering encouragement and showing you step by step how to live. I think in all of our relationships with our kids, with our parents, with people at work, wouldn't it be great if we can whisper encouragement in their ear, we can hold their hand when they're, when they're struggling and that we can show them step by step how to make some steps towards God. Now, one of the great things about being part of a uh, community of faith is that we have some really great role models here and one of the things uh, just when I first became a dad I remember I used to talk to Pastor David Bland quite a bit and I just said Dave just tell me all the things all the things that you learned the hard way so I don't have to learn the hard way and uh, and I just used to just ask him questions about parenting and he's a, he's a great dad and, and Judy's a great mum and so I learned a lot from them but, and I see other parents um, all around the church, grandparents that are godly men and women that I, I look up to so much. Um, because well, I think one thing about being in relationships is we're always aware of where we, we're not together and where we need to grow. And uh, one of the great joys is having friends like Cass and Mike Tompich. And they are fantastic 
parents and they are fantastic uh, pillars as part of our church and I just want to invite them up to share as, as, and ask them a few questions about how they do life in their family. So will you put your hands together and welcome up Cass and Mike. Hey guys. So, even though we're around the same age, I have to say I really look up to both of you guys as parents, and just uh, we we love your family, and um, we always, you know, the kids that you always encourage your kids to be friends with. I want my kids to be friends with. Callan and Angus, because they're, they're fantastic young kids. And um, but guys, I know that in recent times, you, your family life has gone from being, well, still stressful, but it's gone to a new level of complexity. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about what has made your family life so complicated in recent times? And in the season that you're in, it's, tell us about just what has made it so busy and so complicated just for everyone here that doesn't know what you guys have been going through. All right. Um, I have just got back from a three-week placement up at Tanunda to do with uh, teaching and, and my, uh, yeah, my course involves that I basically uh, at a school full-time for three weeks. So Cass has been a little bit busy over the last three weeks, just doing the occasional thing here or there. Is that right? Huge shout out to single parents. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Like, yeah. seriously, I had a little taste for a very short window of time, but I uh, just can't esteem it on you enough. That's good. So, I, I just think it's amazing that these guys, Michael was working full-time, Cass was working um, part-time, but that was increasing, and then you guys felt in God for you to go back to study as a full-time student. Um, so I just admire, I don't know, don't, don't you agree that's a courageous decision for a young family with a mortgage and um, all that, so it's been pretty hectic. Do you ever feel like in the midst of that and having husbands that are on prac and all of your busyness that life is so busy that you have nothing left to give just because there's so much going on I want to answer that question but I just wanted to quickly also say that for us um, our schedule is often changing and we have to constantly navigate evaluate and adjust <coughs> to ensure it works for our family life um, it's stressful when I try and do it in my own strength or I have unrealistic expectations I don't think Michael gets stressed. I was like, <laughs> he's reading his answers to me and I'm like, his, one of them was, do you feel stressful? And he's like, not really. I'm like, yeah, I knew you'd write that. <laughs> he's just such an unflappable person. He just manages to just go about his business and not, not um, get worked up at all. But um, I think rhythm, not balance, is huge. I think balance is where you try and hold everything in, in your hand. Whereas I think looking at the ebb and flow and the rhythm of your family life is, for us, really important. Um, evaluating and assessing where we need to adjust. <coughs> but what I really felt to say is that we've chosen intentionally what we're committed to and what we're involved to. We own the responsibility to make it work for our family, to glorify Jesus and make it work for our family because we've chosen. And I think so many people are busy in life. Life's busy, life's busy, but... We actually have the power to choose what we will do and what we won't do. And so we've, we've made some deliberate choices about that. Um, we do choose to minimise after school activities um, our kids are involved with. <laughs> we choose how many nights I'm out from home. We talk about that. Um, we plan to ensure consistency and structure for our kids around the things that we value and we monitor our energy levels. And we really do believe that we graced for this season that God's called us to do what we're doing together. And there's grace available for every season, but he's graced us for this season. So part B, do I ever feel like I've got nothing left to give? Honestly, yes. Um, and I think it's more of an issue for me of leading myself. Um, 
than anything else. Um, I'm so much better at this than I used to be, praise the Lord. Um, but just learning to disconnect regularly from very real ministry needs and opportunities because you emotionally are involved and then you come home and learning to disconnect from them and to actually um, remember that it's Jesus Church has been huge for me, something I come back to all the time, that um, I can be a faithful steward of what he's entrusted to me and this includes my family. No one else can be a mum to my kids. No one else can be a wife to Michael. That's my role. And so it's a privilege for me to be a mum and a wife and uh, I want to steward that calling, um, among other things, well. Do you want to answer that too? Uh, yes. Um, so my answer is slightly <laughs> different. So I don't get stressed out really easily. Um, it's, almost, it's almost the... What I have to work on is almost the opposite of Cass. So I have to actually um, work on how to be there for my kids and actually not just get things done and look at all the things I've got done today, tick, but actually in doing that, um, really be there for Cass and really be there and actually be present and, and not be, you know, ordering people around and, you know, the success of the day is not on how much I've actually able to do or how clean the house is or whether dinner's made. It's actually, have I invested in... <laughs> Um, into the lives of others, have I invested in my kids, have I invested in Cass, and to actually reflect and go, actually, maybe I didn't do that very well this today, and the house looks fantastic, but is that my main focus? Is that the real reason why I do things? So, um, yeah, slightly different to Cass. Cool. So, tell us about some something that you've learned the hard way about being present in home life. Oh, how long we got here? Um, how we learnt the hard way. Okay, so again, leading on from what I said, it, it's about for me uh, actually engaging and uh, I suppose working out how I'm made and how how God's made me, how God's made Cass and our family, and and so what do I need to then be able to give um, fully to my family? So I really need time to myself. Um, it's called Michael time. Yeah. I need my whole time, so I, I use exercise and sport and, and different things like that to actually spend some time purposely processing and thinking through things. And then from that, I feel like I'm, I'm fueled up, um, talking with God, uh, praying, reflecting on things to actually then um, engage with the whole family. Um, if I try and do that without doing that, it doesn't work very well. <laughs> Um, but yeah, coming from a point of view of, you know, this is how God's made me, I, I, I need time by myself, but that then fuels, um, you know, having those really valuable um, conversations with kids, you know, um, yeah, just asking them questions and trying to understand where they're coming from as well. So um, yeah, that, that, and that helps me to also model how to sort of process my emotions and process, um, you know, what I do and, and actually model that to the boys and for them to realise that, yeah, Dad doesn't get it right all the time but he, he actually is processing those emotions, so. That's good. Um, thank goodness I married Michael. <laughs> we compliment each other and I've learnt so much from him. Um, <coughs> Sometimes the best use of my time in a day is to get down on the floor and play with my kids or just stop and have a cup of tea with my husband. Um, I'm not superwoman. It takes a village to raise a child, raise kids, or it takes a village for our family to do life well. <laughs> we need our in-laws' help. We need people around the church. And I need Jesus, but I really need to lean into the people that God's put in my life to do life with. And also I would say rest and recreation are not optional. That if I ignore physical depletion in my life, it affects my family, it affects me, but I'm responsible to actually renew that. That's good. So that leads on to a, a practical habit or practice that you guys do um, so that you can have quality time together as a family. Um, okay, so there's a few things that we... Um we do as a family. 
Uh, we always try to have uh, dinner together as a family. Um, so, uh, and that's without the TV on generally. Um, to, you know, just really connect with the boys, see how their day's been going and just spend some time just sitting in each other's presence. So I think um, as we do that regularly and more, more regularly, the boys realise that that's a time that they can actually share what's on their heart. Um, we asked them one yay and one nay. So tell us one good thing about today. What was one thing that wasn't so good? And that just starts conversation going. Yeah. <coughs> uh, so that's one thing. We try to do some devotions uh, at night with the boys. That doesn't always necessarily work. But again, um, that's not something necessarily that we do. Um, we also get the boys to actually lead the devotions as well. So they've got little kids' devotion books and they lead us in devotion, which is some really powerful times. So um, for them to actually look up scripture and try and work out what that means and what God's saying to them. So we try to do that a little bit. Um, and try to just involve the family in everything we do to a degree. So... I quite like cricket and going to the cricket, so I thought it would be a good thing for the whole family to go to the cricket. So I buy them family I'm not tickets. so much a fan. <laughs> but um, it's family time, so, you know, she couldn't get out of that. So. And, we want, and we want a holiday, so I'm, like, hooked. I'm coming every year just in case, no. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just things like that. Even if Cass doesn't really want to go, she enjoys actually being a part of the family. Um, even we get a lot of emails from Cass during the cricket. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. She doesn't really know what's going on, but that's okay. Me and the boys watch. You go. <laughs> um, I think family holidays for us are really important times. Um, I read a quote by someone that said, you know, if we spent less on the toys that we, we give our kids and actually spent some good money on family holidays, they're the things that kids remember. Quality time with their parents. I don't know about you, but I remember my family holidays. I don't really remember what I had <coughs> as a toy when I was nine. So for us, family holidays is really important. If we've had a really busy time, my parents live on a four-acre property at Angerston, so we'll shoot up there an hour away just for the weekend or overnight, and it's just beautiful to be able to recharge and connect and have that time. So just trying to monitor busy seasons for us, Tim. Like if we go into a busy season, like a camp or a conference, we then try and overbalance on the other side with family time. Yep. yep. That's cool. Um, and how do you guys... Um, deal with as a family times of conflict does that ever happen in your family yes <laughs> of course that happens in our family um, how do we deal with it I think trying to help our kids name their emotions has been a big one for us so trying to say it's okay to have feelings it's okay to feel intense emotions but helping them name them and then helping them understand that they have a choice with how they respond and we have a choice with how we respond and so there's lots of times when I've had to say, sorry that mum was so snappy today or please forgive me or I yelled at you today and I should have asked in a much nicer voice, please forgive me. And so a big thing for me and the boys is do we need a fresh start? We might say that to each other once or twice a That's day. Good. Do we need a fresh start? Yes. <laughs> Either I'm asking or they're asking. It's just become part of our language now. That's so good. I like that. Um, yeah, so just, again, modelling that... Um, yeah, being humble enough to say sorry to um, <coughs> the boys and Cass when I haven't quite got it right, um, which happens a fair amount, but but just for them to realise that even as, as adults, we don't know what we're doing sometimes and, and, you know, it's okay to say sorry. Again, models that to them. Um, and the other thing we do um, is sort of works on personalities a little bit so one of our sons is a little bit more similar to the way Cass is made so I might and we have our moments <laughs> so instead of them headbutting um for hours it would seem sometimes <laughs> I, I, I might um I might get involved in that and help um redirect the um emotion of, of you're the very day. diplomatic mike <laughs> <laughs> you're going to be a great teacher um and him and angus are very similar too so then, yeah just a little bit so <laughs> they can be both crossing their arms in two corners and so it's just yeah. i guess drawing in each other's strengths with that is important yeah he's a strong croatian man your husband um and finally last question what are the guiding values behind the choices that you make as a family um I think there's a f quite a few, but I guess a really helpful tool that we've 
tried to implement is to try and give our kids context for why we're making decisions as a family in the here and now and what the bigger picture is. So a really helpful thing that we got from a parenting toolbox, which is an organisation that runs <laughs> workshops for kids, is just the phrase, in our family, we. And so they might be talking about, can we do this or can we do that? Well, in our family, we are committed to coming to church and we're involved in church. And so sometimes that's going to mean that we say no to a birthday party or, you know, we, we might rearrange because that's a guiding value in our life, that we're involved in Jesus' church, we're part of his family and we give to that. So um, that's, I guess, an example. But I also think generosity is a massive one for us. We look for ways to be generous. Um, a lot of kids, when they leave our house after a play date, leave with a toy. I try and teach my boys that, you know, to hold things loosely and to look for ways that they can. And sometimes they just volunteer. Oh, can I give Jojo this? Or can I? Thanks for the Ninja Turtles, by the way. <laughs> but I think it's good to model that for your kids that, you know, they're always looking for ways that they can be generous to others. That's good. Did you uh, I suppose I just, I'm not sure if it's a value, but I always try to get the... Um, boys in particular to think and process, um, you know, so on the way to church, you know, I'll, I'll question them and say, why, why do we go to church, you know, what, what, you know, and actually get them to start thinking about um, some of these things. So this morning we went, I asked them and they said that, um, Angus said, so we get to be with Jesus forever. And I'm not, I don't prompt them at all. Um, and Callan said, so we can um, be strong to invite other people to come to know him. So just, just, and again, I don't tell them the right or wrong answers, but just trying to get them to think about, you know, is that footy game we watched last night more exciting than Jesus in why or why not? Again, I don't say what I think, um, but, you know, just getting them to realise what is important in life um, at a young age. It's good, guys. Hey, um, why don't we put our hands together and thank Cass and Mike.